Hello, uh, I'm Evgeny. I'm with uh, Uber ATG, the uh, autonomous division of Uber, and uh, I work on perception team. Um, today, I'm here to talk to you about a Petastorm. Petastorm is a library that we uh, recently have open sourced, and its goal is to allow to stream data directly from uh, Apache Parquet stores into uh, machine learning frameworks such as TensorFlow. Uh, PyTorch doesn't have to be limited by that because it will work with anything written in Python. Uh, we will expose a little bit about uh, of internal data flows that happen within the within our organization, and we'll try to explain why did we create this this library. I would guess the problems that we uh, encountered would be uh, kind of familiar to you as to some of you at least as well, because some. Uh, it's a natural process that happens within an organization trying to use the data. We are a little bit, I think we're a little bit special with the kind of data that we work with because there's a lot of sensor data, uh, probably more than a common deep learning scenario. So we'll cover that as well. So for us, this is our vehicle. We use a platform for, as a platform for uh, autonomous driving. You can see that it has a, a bunch of sensors and sensors, of course, they serve uh, uh, our robot our vehicle to understand what's going on around it uh, in in the world you can see there is a uh, there is a lidar on top which is a spinning uh, laser uh, range sensing device there are several cameras here in this sensor pod on top there are radars in the vehicle kind of borrowed from uh, it's well it's common in uh, in uh, in vehicles these days but it's something that's coming from fighter jets uh, there are ultrasonic radars etc cetera, etc cetera. So there are tons of data, tons of sensors that is being streamed into our robot uh, system. So this is a high level conceptual data flow. Sensors go into uh, some software, some robotic software, and the output of it is our commands uh, to um, uh, accelerate, de decelerate, left, right, et cetera. It's kind of simplistic explanation. But what's going on inside here is a huge, huge machine that processes process tons of sensor Data. And of course, today the most uh, the most advanced results we can get with deep learning with neural uh, networks. This means we need to train them, and the most common way to, to do that is with supervised data. So this is what's what's happening on board. This kind of uh, this is the data that goes within the vehicle. But once the vehicle comes to a, to a docking station, we hook it up, connect to our system, and we start offloading information from it. How does the information that we offload look like? Uh, it's quite common for robotic systems to be structured as a set of uh, asynchronous running tasks which communicate which one with another uh, with message passing. And each message will have its own strong, strongly typed format. For example, there would be some, uh, an agent that is connected to the camera and just sends every couple of uh, milliseconds another, uh, another frame grabbed from the camera. So you can imagine it's going to be quite a big message. Uncompressed full HD image would be about seven megabytes. There would be other kind of messages like uh, location messages, like GPS, probably just a couple of bytes. So they're very, it's very um, asymmetric. So once we, um, and this, some of these messages can be logged to some persistent store on board and then offloaded off board, which means that we'll end up with uh, files that look basically a stream of, uh, of these messages. They're all heterogeneous, heterogeneous. They are sent at different times. So it's, it's it doesn't look like a table, like a record that you use in machine learning, in deep learning. I mean. So uh, let's say we, I am a data scientist. I want to create some algorithm that would process uh, this data. I would need to do, obviously, first take, uh, write some data extraction script that talks to different uh, uh, data sources. By the way, yeah, um, this, these logs are just one of the data sources because we also have Mapping information, we have supervision information labels. So we need to know to connect to all these repositories and uh, somehow join between them. So I can get a PF records file if I am a TensorFlow uh, guy. If I'm not a TensorFlow guy, I'm probably going to be using a different format and I'm probably going to rewrite the code uh, from scratch. And again, these systems are pretty complex and they are not built only for, uh, for uh, for machine learning. So the interfaces of the systems are much wider than what we actually need. So hence the complexity and the learning curve that these researchers would need to uh, go through in order to 
successfully build their data set. And, if, and they're not doing it very often because let's say, a new project starts every couple of months. So it's something that you cannot specialize in. As I mentioned, the messages are quite big. So if we are talking about data sets, these data sets would have each training sample could be a couple of megabytes to maybe more than 10 megabytes of size. And uh, we do have quite a lot of them, so we could, we could have potentially data sets of tens and maybe hundreds uh, terabytes, which is quite a lot. And we have another here researcher that uses PNG files to store his data. Okay, it's his choice. Of course, we want to simplify that, right? We see a lot of repetitive effort. We want to help. How do we help? We want to create one single repository that is friendly for machine learning, for the training. And ideally, we want to stream the data from that repository directly to our training frameworks. Right? And then th this is a recipe to get some happy researchers. That's what we want to do. And this is, where, this is what Petastrom facilitates. Right? Petastrom fac facilitates this part, but without it, we wouldn't be able to have the complete picture. Now we need to talk about what kind of technology can we put here, because not everything is going to work. What are the requirements? We have multiple researchers, and actually we want multiple researchers working on different kind of projects to use the same, same uh, repository, same data set. This is not trivial, because some researchers would like to focus on some of the data. Let's say we have here 10 different cameras and LiDAR data, and I am building now a camera algorithm. I want to be able to uh, very efficiently just a subset of these columns. Otherwise, again, one, one compressed camera, two and a half megabytes, 10 of them is 25 megabytes, right? I just need two and a half. I don't want to stream 25 because my GPU is going to sit idle and do nothing during the time. So we need to support some sort of a, a efficient way to access columns. We need to support some, way, some efficient way to access, to access subset of rows. For example, I want to boost and uh, the number of pedestrians that I have in my training set. Right, so it means I need to select something. I need to be able to do it relatively efficient. Uh, another requirement is basically to have minimally processed data. Why? Because I don't want to allow a particular algorithm implementation or detail to, to leak in the way I store the data. Otherwise, other people can't use it. So we need to guard against uh, people putting here pre-processed data. And we want to, to manage it with one team that is responsible for the stability and the quality of this data. Again, we can put, like, we are a relatively big organization, we can put some people that are actually going to be responsible to have very clean and stable and accessible and robust, highly available uh, set of uh, data. Once we're able to do that, we immediately get obvious uh, advantages, like easy way to compare, compare models. Uh, since I, everyone right now in the organization know what is the date, like this my master data set version 18, we can both talk in the same language. We don't need to think, okay, we derived some directory and I have something that I think is coming from there. So either I need to build systems to track these complex relations, so I just throw them away and make the process more efficient uh, all the way through. And experiment reproducibility, again, because we have common language, we know that we are training with data set 18. If it's being deleted, it's okay, we have a copy of it. So because we have a central maintenance, there is high reliability. What are the technologies that can serve this kind of uh, access pattern? A couple of words, what people, what, what is typically being done, at least the naive approaches. First, let's, say, let's just say the directory, have a directory with uh, a bunch of files. Uh, all, every image will have its own PNG file and uh, we can save, uh, supervision data either in separate database or just CSV files near the PNG files. So this doesn't work very well when you try to scale to the scales that we need to work with, right? In our case, our data set would be probably 100 million files, which makes, it's, it's very hard to get a file system that would be able to uh, support this kind of workflows, right? Uh, for sure, not HDFS. You cannot have that many small files in HDFS and expect it to function. S3 will also suffer, will also suffer from, from latency issues. Uh, another approach is to use tens what TensorFlow uh, kind of provides you out of the box. TF records basically take your table, take your set of rows, and st uh, store them as protobuf, just one after another. It is, th this kind of approach is friendly for uh, 
large for, for HDFS and uh, S3. However, we won't get this kind of a columnar uh, access uh, in a scalable way. Why? Because in order to parse a, prot uh, a protobuf, you do need to load all of it. So it, it wouldn't work as well in, in this kind of a setup. So what would work? Uh, something that is pretty common in the industry today is Apache Parquet format, right? It's used kind of in big data scenarios. It's not used very frequently, at least to my knowledge, in the scenarios when you need to work with sensor data, when you do uh, deep learning. So we started with uh, Apache Parquet and tried to adapt it and use it in our, in our workflow, right? Uh, why does it, why does it uh, work? So it is a columnar store, which means that instead of storing row after row after row continu uh, continuously on your disk, you're first storing column A, then you store column B. One small twist on this statement is that there is a, uh, you don't store the entire column, but you chunk it into smaller pieces, so it's more manageable, right? Because if I have a, I don't know, three terabyte column, uh, um, we can randomly access these chunks, right? So there are indexes that support this kind of access pattern. I can choose, okay, I want just arbitrary uh, th th to get this chunk only, right? If it would be lo longer, this, this diagram here, I could point to any of the chunks and would be able to, to load it uh, right away. I think usually we would have like each chunk of images would be say 100 megabytes. So we'll be loading a bunch of images at once. And a nice feature is this is very common uh, format. Hence, there are a lot of tools out there, including uh, uh, Spark that we are using that supports this natively and it integrates very nicely and provides us different, uh, different benefits that we'll show a little bit later. So, right, so we almost got the entire, entire thing. Uh, I mean, we, dec we decided what we want to use as a storage format and then now we need to read it and actually do the training into TensorFlow or PyTorch. Uh, if there wouldn't be any petastorm in existence, we would need to do something like this. A researcher that comes and wants to do some, uh, to do some modeling will need to do an ATL stage and to get some repository, take the parquet store and derive a TF record, so HDF5 repository, or again, multiple small file uh, directory, and that would be used for training and evaluation, right? So petastorm, so this last problem is basically streamlining and short, shortening this last stage of the pipeline. So we can go directly to our master store and start training from there efficiently. Uh, efficiently. And here back to our complete picture, what we managed to achieve instead of uh, researchers deriving their own small uh, or their, old, uh, their private uh, data sets, we have a master data set that is now accessible by researchers without any extra ETL steps. Here again, a, a high level view of the process. This is what, what's happening. We have three different uh, sources of information, the logs, the autonomous vehicle logs, the AV logs, maps and uh, labels. We use Spark job to uh, create this store, which is a parquet store with a small twist of some of metadata that Petastorm writes here. We'll talk about this in a second. Uh, then a researcher just by giving a URL to this, uh, to the store is able to stream tensors into the training procedure directly. Uh, what do we store here as a metadata? So Apache, so, uh, Apache Parquet supports uh, primitive types, such as integers, floats, decimal strings out of the box. So you can have a column with uh, integers. But in our case, it's not integers that we want to store, but we want to store tensors. And this is something that is not part of the Parquet vocabulary. So we need to do something else. A naive thing to do, and obvious thing to do, is to use binary, uh, binary type, binary blob type, and put our data there but we wouldn't have the needed uh, schema information for that. So together with, uh, with the data, we store also our schema information, which is uh, name of the field, uh, dimension of the tensor and the type of the tensor, right? These this three pieces of information. On top of that, we also provide within Petastorm a layer of codecs, which means that we can compress data. For example, images, a field that is an image, 
we will apply an image compression to that field to do it more efficiently. And it's also quite, a, it's extensible, so you can derive your own codecs without even submitting anything to the, uh, uh, any pull request, you can extend it with your own codecs. So here we have again Apache Parquet store. In some cases, you might want to derive to create some uh, derivative data set, I don't know, some special filtering or some special order of rows that, uh, that, that would guarantee a better training performance. So uh, you can do that as well. And it becomes easy because we are here working with Spark. So it's, uh, manipulations of the, on these huge data sets become very easy, no custom scripts, no custom cluster integration, nothing. You just open a notebook uh, with Spark uh, with Spark and you're uh, done. And of course, this part of streaming the data has to be scalable because you don't want to starve your GPU. So we spent a lot of thought and uh, implementation and polishing to make it actually fast. Some examples of using Petastorm. Uh, you will see that all examples are very concise and that's because our main goal our optimization function is to make a uh, data scientist's life easy. Uh, maybe extraction could be more complex of the data set, but downstream it will be very easy to access the data. So this is a pure Python implementation, right? You create a reader as it was a file, just pointed to HDFS path, and then you can iterate over reader and get samples from it. Uh, there are a bunch of def the, there are a bunch of options here that like this is your default one, but there, the, it's quite configurable, and all the configuration would go through uh, through these options here. Uh, note that you got here an image, right? An image was automatically decompressed for you, and it was compressed when it was uh, written to the to the store, because we store this uh, metadata that allows us to know how to read with these fields. Again, with TensorFlow, you would need either to implement your own mechanism to uh, coordinate between the code that generates TF records and then reads TF record, or you could get mismatches. It is decode row calls or decode images calls, which is a uh, source for, for problems sometimes. So yeah, TensorFlow. How does it look in, in TensorFlow? So I want to get a tensor that would stream the data to me and I want to hook it into my model. The beginning is exactly as the previous slide. I create a, uh, a reader, uh, and then there is one utility function that takes this reader and makes it look like just tensors. And then you can hook tensors to whatever TensorFlow uh, operations that you want. Right, again, couple of lines of code, you are done. Okay, we also support TF Data API, the new way of TensorFlow to read the data, relatively new. Same thing, instead of TF tensors, you use make Petastorm dataset, and from there, you can do everything that you do on the uh, data set, including shuffling, uh, uh, ma mapping, uh, mapping different fields with, with your custom function, with operations. So yeah, so from here and on, it looks like a regular data set. Uh, one thing that is still missing for, to complete this full, full picture here, we don't have implementation, we don't support uh, reinitializable uh, iterators, just single shot iteration, iterator. Uh, we will let the support uh, at some stage. It's not too complicated whenever we go to it, simply. Um, PyTorch, same thing. Instead of using a data loader, standard uh, data loader from PyTorch, uh, you use our data loader just from a different package. It has the same interface, but it takes a reader as a parameter instead of a Torch uh, data set. This is an example, how do, can, we, can we access real AV data now, these days in our organization? Uh, for example, I want to point top-down view of, uh, of a LiDAR scan, right? So how does, it, how does it work? I create a reader, point to, sense, to the data set, get an example, and I already have the fields I can use to plot right away. Very quick. And no, notice that th this thing looks kind of like a, uh, like a database, if you want, uh, interface, right? You don't need to know anything a priori about your schema, about your data. You just provide a connection string and you start getting the data. So it is kind of a data, it's kind of a database for tensor, uh, tensor friendly database that is hookable directly to your, um, uh, to your ML framework. 
why isn't why uh, working with Parquet? Uh, how does it help us when we work with Spark? Since Parquet is a standard and natively supports Spark uh, format, we can do these sim simple inquiries. Right, just select number of rows from a certain path. Right, imagine if you have a directory with uh, TF records and you want to answer a question, how many rows you have there? You need to write probably a script and start passing the entire thing. Here you have a spark at your fingertips to do much more flexible queries than you would be able to do uh, quickly with other formats. Um, one thing to mention that um, since some fields are encoded, like the images and tensors that are not native to, um, to Parquet, they wouldn't be understandable by Spark out of the box. They would be just binary, binary blobs. So we provide a fu convenience function that presents the data set as a RDD. Uh, RDD is, a, I don't know, for those who didn't work with Spark, basically it's a distributed uh, a set of data. Um, so here, from this RDD, if you try to get an image, you will get already automatically a decoded image. So you can research and experiment with your data from standard uh, notebooks uh, without, without any problem. Unischema is the, um, the object that helps us bind all these environments together and do seamlessly the conversions of types. It is just a schema, right? Look what kind of formation we have. So uh, just the field name, the type of the, of the field. If this is a uh, tensor, we can specify constraints on the dimensions. If some dimensions are, uh, are unknown or variable, we can specify known. Uh, and we specify also what kind of codec do we, codecs do we use to persist the data. So PNG will get image compression if we use a compressed image codec on, uh, on this field, right, on this tensor. And there is also, uh, uh, whether it's nullable or not, uh, this helps to validate data when we write to the data set. So it uh, uh, helps us prevent mistakes in the ETL scripts. Um, yeah and provides a way for interoperability between all these environments, right? And it's all hidden under Petastorm implementation. A, our reader implementation, what, what is this reader thing? It's kind of an umbrella class that covers a bunch of uh, underlying code. Uh, essentially, what we have is a, a worker pool, which is configurable whether it's a thread pool or process pool. And in some scenarios, one is better than another. And it depends very much on the kind of data and what kind of um, what what kind of data and what whether you work from PyTorch or uh, TensorFlow. Sometimes it's important. Uh, each worker is reading and decoding the data from the data set, puts the results in the result queue, and from here we uh, uh, stream it either to Python code directly or go through some adapters to get uh, TensorFlow uh, objects. And as a convenience function, we can also uh, add a shuffling queue, TensorFlow shuffling queue here in the middle. Now let's talk about uh, um, different facilities that the reader provides for, um, uh, for its users, right? Besides the default command line, def default uh, make reader function, there are a bunch of things you can specify. For example, row predicate is a way to filter the rows, rows of interest. Uh, just a Python function that you can specify which uh, column you want to use, which column you're going to filter on, and the function that returns is a true or false. Um, it's more efficient than just getting all the rows and then deciding yourself why. Because uh, if we are using partitioning in Parquet store, it will make, make use of it and make the query much more efficient, right? You're going to discard the entire partitions uh, before even reading that. Also, if you are filtering by some, uh, let's say, by label, I want only pedestrian uh, labels, and there are no pedestrian labels in a particular row group, I'm not going to load any sensor data, so my scanning is going to be much faster. So there, th these are the optimizations behind the uh, row predicates. Um, we support sharding and uh, local caching. Uh, sometimes they can work even together. What is sharding? Basically splitting your data set into uh, sub pieces. If you prefer to do distributed training 
and to stream only one shard, one part of the data set to, uh, to one of the workers, you can do it like that. Here's the sy uh, syntax. Our total and which, what is the current shard that we are talking about. So in this case, we would be getting one tenth of the data streamed by the, uh, by the reader. We are going to get a, uh, shard number three and the shards are non-overlapping. So you can basically virtually divide your data set into smaller pieces. Uh, that being said, it's not guaranteed that the pieces are going to be exactly the same, uh, the same length uh, because we basically, we hash uh, the row groups, which are uh, sub pieces of the parquet, so, uh, groups of rows, and then we basically do, uh, we hash and then modulus number of shard, shards, we are getting an index of a particular shard. So it's, it's kind of runtime, there's nothing is being persisted, but there's no guarantees that you're going to get exactly the same number of rows. It also helps for quick experimentations. Some, some researchers uh, use that. If you want to do more, uh, faster iterations, but on a smaller subset of data, just with these two parameters, you can, uh, you can slice your data into 10 pieces and take one. Uh, there, are, there is a local caching. Uh, basically, if you have a slow link or a link that costs lots of money to download data, you can, uh, with a para configuration parameter, make all the data and that you read end up in your local cache. Once it's there, you don't need to read anymore. And uh, you can think about an interesting combination between these two sharding and local cache. If you do the local cache uh, fully in memory and you have enough compute nodes to shard your data so it fits into memory, then with this just two configuration, configuration parameter, you would be able uh, to read, to do IO only once and from there on, everything is going to be, you'll be training from, from your memory. And this is how you enable the, uh, uh, the caching. Just parameter to make reader, local disk, uh, local disk cache. Another interesting feature is uh, n-grams. What are n-grams? Let me give you an example. If your data set is stored in a sorted order, right? Uh, for us, it's logs that we download from the vehicle. So we have consequent frames, things are happening. You can uh, view it as, as a video, video clip. And if this data is actually sorted inside your data set, you can do the following uh, trick. Some models would, uh, are using temporal context for, as their input, right? So I want this frame and a couple of previous frames, right? Because uh, it, it can help in, the, in decision making. If there is some occlusion and there is someone is hiding behind the wall, but he was not hiding in the previous frame, it will help me get some, some idea of what, what's going on there, right? So the, the naive approach, Let's say I'm using uh, TF records again. Uh, I would be putting in each record, I would put in all three frames of my temporal context, which means in this scenario, I'm going to, to uh, store nine copies of the data total. However, when I'm reading the data that is sorted, I can use the engrams feature of uh, Petastorm, which would emit three different samples from these five rows, right? So I got this sequence uh, of five. I need a uh, kind of windows of three. I will get output samples that are generated on the fly in memory. One sample, red sample, yellow sample, and a green sample. And how much, I read, how much data did I read here? Five, so approximately half. So I s saved half of the bandwidth here, right? Uh, a word of uh, warning is you need to be very careful, careful with sorted data sets because you get high correlation between your uh, samples that are flowing in your training. So you need some strong and big chaffing queue, uh, queue to, to decorrelate this data. But from the Petterstorm perspective, we are able to save a lot of bandwidth in these scenarios when we do it like that. Uh, okay, so now how do you generate a data set? It's a Spark job. Again, it's more complicated than reading the data from Petastorm, but it's okay, it's by, kind of by design. It's not what we optimize for. Uh, the idea is here that you create an RDD, row generator, an example of a function that creates dictionary with your data. Uh, uh, with bold, you will see we highlighted the, uh, the pieces that are uh, specific to Petastorm. So we do everything within uh, this um, uh, context manager that helps us to gen uh, generate metadata at the end. Uh, we uh, use this function, dict to spark row. We provide a dictionary and under the, this schema prior, we, 
we basically we com compress the data and we validate the data so we know that this row in the data frame uh, that we are going to create is actually complies to the schema and we write it with standard means we write a parquet file standard spark spark code that's it uh, ah forgot about this one so yeah the the schema the spark scheme uh, the SQL schema that Spark needs is coming also from uni schema object. This is another facet of, uh, of the uni schema. It can be rendered as, uh, as a data frame schema, as a, as a Spark schema. Uh, that's kind of it. Uh, future work, what we want to uh, improve. For example, one feature that we just implemented is uh, support a, just a regular parquet files that are not generated by this code, but coming from some other systems. If you don't have any special tensor data, right? Because we need to know how to uh, encode it and decode it, but standard uh, parquet data like uh, integers, strings, etc., we don't really need our own metadata to, to do anything to read it, right? So uh, we need to support, we already support this. It's not, it's not the feature is not landed fully, which means you're going to get a very bad performance if you're working with rows and that are small. All our use cases were with like uh, megabytes and tens of megabytes. Here suddenly we try to work with small data, we need to polish some things and uh, optimize. So once we have that, you'll be able to take your um, parquet uh, file generated by, I don't know, Hive, Spark, somewhere else in some other part of your pipeline and just uh, take the data into TensorFlow directly or PyTorch. Uh, we want. We are using underneath Apache Arrow uh, to read uh, Parquet. This is a quite. It's a very strong library that allows you to do a lot of um, a lot of work uh, without copying memory. So we need to optimize our code to make better use of it. Um, things will get faster once we do that, and we need to improve PyTorch support. I didn't mention it, but uh, we are we are still working on improving the PyTorch support. We have a couple of internal cases that we are use we use to polish it. With PyTorch, you might not get great, great experience in all cases out of the box. So we are working to improve that. And um, these are the links that are in, uh, Uber Engineering blog about uh, this uh, this product. There is, a, well, of course, of course, have a GitHub page. You can download and play with the project there. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much for for your attention.